This episode of the Fishing Daily Podcast is brought to you by Saltwater Marketing. Saltwater Marketing, marketing experts for commercial fishing and seafood industry in Ireland and the UK. Welcome to the Fishing Daily Podcast with me, Oliver McBride. Today I'm joined by Patrick Murphy from the Irish South and West Fish Producers Organisation. And we'll be talking, amongst other things, uh, around the December Council, the decommissioning and tie-up scheme. And we'll also be looking at what's been happening in the fishing industry the past year, coming up on the first anniversary of the Trade and Corporation Agreement. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, Alpha, and hello to the listeners and viewers. Yes, Patrick. Um, December Council's coming up. The fishing industry is not looking great. Where are we at? What's the minister going to be looking for when he gets out there? I don't think he's going to be looking for anything, really. I think it's um, a case to maybe have have what you hold. We put in a, a comprehensive paper into the minister. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't at the meeting with the minister uh, the past couple of days. I was actually in a flight, so one of the lads from the organisation took the meeting. But we got a comprehensive report on this. Uh, we're facing savage cuts in certain key stocks, again, um, on the science that contradicts itself. Um, and for us, it's very easy to look at the maps and, and, and the stock book that comes from the Marine Institute every year and scratch our heads and, and, and wonder why. And we have countries that have fishing rights and access to fish that are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their countries, yet they seem to have a greater share of fish in those areas than the indigenous population who are meant to be depending on it. And for us, to hope that we get more fish in the December Council is, um, I'd say, misguided at best. And, and to explain that, when we go to the December Council, what you're actually asking the others to do is to give up their fish. Now, I've always contended that we're not actually asking them to give up fish that they're catching, just fish that they have a right or entitled to under the common fishery policy. So if you're not catching the fish, we revert back to the most modern of, of marine laws, which is the um, Uniclass law that was written in Montego Bay in 1995, not the common fishery policy that was designed in 1973 and incorporated in 1983. So 12 years later, we had a more modern, a more uh, succinct law that the United Nations signed up to. Well, because we're part of a club in Europe and we're the smallest in that club with the smallest population, um, we're being bullied. Uh, and that's the reasons why when our minister goes to the December Council, I'd say he's more or less laughed at uh, by the other countries. So where do we go with that one? We'll go to the December Council and we'll try and have what we hold, um, mitigate some of the, the tear and the cuts that are coming towards us, take the flack from the NGOs then that we're overfishing and we're going above what the scientific advice is advising and everything else. And, and, and we'll come out afterwards defending that. What is important though, is that we should realise that the review of the common fishery policy, which we fought for in Gat and Kitty Beggs from the EU commissioner not so long ago, uh, which was a turnaround, by the way, um, is something that we should be working on. And it is since October now, um, we've done nothing. Um, and not us as per se have done nothing, but the minister hasn't done nothing and the department hasn't done anything. And that's where we should be concentrating on. Um, and that's where we are 24 months on. Um, to lead into the other topics that you raised at the start of it is um, just to explain <clears throat> to the viewers, we had our morale of our industry was on the floor. We had just been told we'd lost 20% of our fish um, and that the future was bleak. We already knew that we were already short in many of the key stocks in many of the demersal fisheries that we were in. That boats were struggling just to make a living and um, and really struggling. But not only that, they were um, in danger of slipping outside the law, as we might put it, because of the mixed up fishery that they're in. That if they happen to have a bonzana or something with other people to jump up and down and cheer and shout for, our fellas end up putting their heads in their hands and going, oh my Jesus God, we've, we've caught the wrong fish, we're in trouble here. That is incredible for an ordinary person to understand, but that's the day the torture of a fisherman who goes out to sea not to catch fish but to avoid the ones that are scarce 
and pray to God that he catches the one that he's allowed to catch to make his living. Crazy scenario. Um, so after hearing that, the boats and our members, they'd just given up hope. And I guarantee if some fella came in, they'd be nearly throwing the keys of the boats uh, up and counters, I'd say, just say, take them away, it was so bad. So our organisation were um, talking about doing something drastic following the, the events of the past, maybe blocking a port and or two and, and creating civil disobedience and making life tough for everybody else. And when we looked into it, we found that the laws had changed since the last protest and they had brought in stringent fines and literally on top of a bad situation, it would make things worse and would actually more or less take businesses off leads if they did and were prosecuted. And we know how uh, anxious our department and our government are to take a fisherman into a court and criminalise him and 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 uh, put him across the coals and cost hundreds of thousands in our judiciary system, um, and which is 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 another sad indictment of of what um, we should see happening in reverse rather than um, what's the application of the law to our fishermen. In other words, we should be going to Europe and we should be fighting them in their courtrooms to say that it's not right that you're taking our natural resource from us in such a magnitude that's damaging our coastal communities and the viability of our coastal communities that depend on it and is written in European regulations. So back to where why the reason we, we did the flotillas. We went to, to, to Cork and we did so on our own. We did reach out uh, to try and get unity within the industry and we were unsuccessful, but we went along with it anyway. But what did become apparent was that we weren't the only organisation that felt frustrated that there didn't seem to be anything happening and that there was no uh, no one at the tiller, right? No one at the steering wheel, no no one plotting a course. And the Irish South and West um, did that and we did it alone. But other boats came from other organisations uh, despite the advice coming from their um, representatives um, and they came and they joined us. And from that then, I think, what was witnessed was welcomed and it gave a small bit of hope back to everybody in the industry and from that it moved to Dublin and that's where we went to and we did and we achieved what we wanted to achieve in those processes which was to arrange um, um, to get to Dublin do so peaceably act responsibly get our message out there and we did this now we got in every media outlet we got in radio shows very popular radio shows and televisions. We got the Dáil deputies to come out um, from the convention centre to speak with us and speak on camera, and we had it recorded. So the aim of the uh, flotillas was achieved. What happened afterwards did not um, coincide with what every boat went looking for up there and on the banners from all the organisations. And it was very simple. We want our fish back. We do not want decommissioning. We don't want money, we don't want aid, we just want the right to go fishing. And that's that was the clear message that came out from uh, those protests. Very clear. The problem is now we, we do have decommissioning and it seems to be that when you ask people whose idea it was, it's, it, it seems to be that it's the department that wants this more than any fisherman. You see, this, this is the incredible situation now that we're in, right? And, and I'll explain it like this. Our fish was taken from us, and we had three options presented to us under the terms of reference for the task force. One was burden sharing. Two was financial um, uh, implications. And three was a review of the common fishery policy, right? Now, we wanted the review of the common fishery policy and looking for more fish and burden sharing to be at the top. And in fairness, to the fishermen's organisations, that's the line we held. But to be honest, and I have the paperwork here alongside me, like, and it's, it's, it's fairly thick, if it can be picked up on the camera. This, these are the documents that we sent into the, the, to the task force. And they're consistent. And, and we stayed on the path and at the tiller that we were pointed to go at. So how did we end up now that there is a decommissioning scheme? Well, Time went by, we were told that, oh, we didn't know what the European Union wanted, what were the parameters, 
uh, the feedback we were getting from the European Union wasn't good, and they did, weren't allowing this, and they didn't allow that, and 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 the scheme of the, the the scheme itself, and the scope of the scheme, and the parameters of the scheme didn't marry to what we were looking for. Of course, it didn't. Why would it? They were, the, the European Union has never done anything for Irish fishermen. They might have opened the doors for us to sell our fish in the continent at a lower price than our competitors. We always seem to get a lower price. And that's to feed the people of Europe. It, they're not doing us any major favours. They're taking 85% of our fish and they're leaving us with 15%. And we get at max as a, a market, market access in return. That's it. So why would they start doing us favours now? It was told to me by senior politicians, the only reason Ireland got 20%. It was the first time that Ireland, as a small nation, got the greatest share of any pie from Europe. We got over 20% of the BAR fund. And as I said, senior politicians told me that the reason why we got that was because of the noise we were making and the embarrassing statements we were making for the European Union, including my um, statement that called for the head of, of the fisheries section um, to, to be sat straight up for the comment that she made about uh, the reason we lost so much over every other country in Europe was our proximity to the UK. What a justification to crucify the country where everybody comes to fish. The only two countries that really have the fish is the UK and Ireland. The UK ended up with 75% of the fish in their waters. Ireland ended up with 15%. The ones that negotiated that was the European Union. Did they do us any favours? Absolutely not. So what did they do in return? They gave us 500 million. And in the task force, it was always orchestrated towards that. And it was driven by um, the department. And this is what they wanted. Now, here's the crazy thing. The reason why we didn't support the decommissioning in the end, even though we know it's a reality, there will be decommissioning. There's no question of it, right? So the department, since I've joined the job, we're looking at decommissioning as a solution to Ireland's problems of not having enough or a great enough share in our own waters, nowhere else, to sustain our fleet. Simple as that. So we'll reduce the fleet to fit the size of the opportunities that we have. And here they were gifted a chance from Europe after getting 20% of the money. And what did they do? They decided to nobble the figures. So to explain that, they want 8,000 tonnes to be decommissioned. The maximum amount that they're saying they'll pay out is 12,000 per GT. But if you multiply 8,000 by 8,000 per GT, you end up with 64 million. So that's the maximum I see that boats will be getting in this decommissioning scheme. That's the that's 64 million, that's the budget spent. If they're going to achieve the aims that they set out in the paperwork that they said are necessary to balance the opportunities of the fleet. So they had free money from Europe. We got the least amount to decommission our fleet and yet we're being forced in. Like, so even when they got what they wanted, they couldn't be um, uh, victorious and, and, and be magnag magnanimous in victory because they were the ones that wanted it. It wasn't the industry, and that was uh, easily identified in, in the protests in both Cork and Dublin. And here we are at this conjuncture. We've not one day's work, not one hour done on the CFP. Nothing. Not a minute. Relatively. It's a December. It's a relatively cheap deal for, for Europe, getting rid of more Irish boats for, for that. Well, Oliver, I keep interrupting when you say something like that, that just sets the, 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 the synapses firing in all different directions. Let, let's look at this. We have 180 boats over 18 metres in, in our fleet, right? So they want to get rid of 60. So that's a third of the fleet. So if they're valuing that they can buy out that third of the fleet for 63 million, then multiply it by three, and that's the value of the fleet. So our own department are valuing the entire demersal fleet of this country, less than 200 million. 
And as I said to somebody before I was talking to you, genuinely, if I thought I could buy up the Irish fleet for 100 and, or, uh, 180 or 200 million, I would definitely be doing the European lotto a little bit more often. Because can you imagine having the entire you, uh, Irish fleet it, as, as yours? For God's sake, like, that just shows the absolute lunacy of, of the figures that were that came out of the task force. Now, bear in mind, right, we, we, we delve into this a little deeper. So if a boat got a grant deed in the past five years, and now they're forced out of the industry, and anybody says it's voluntary, it's only cod themselves, and, and, and I'll explain that in a second, right? But... So you're, you're, you're going to be forced out of the industry, right? And the question I would ask is this. If we got the fish back, if somebody said tomorrow morning, do you know what? We're after looking at the figures. We're looking at the fee days. We're looking at the other countries. We're after looking at the opportunities. The fish that is not caught by other European countries in your waters, only in your waters, only in your EEZ, right? They are not catching this fish. And because your fleet needs it, we're giving to, this to you. So imagine walking down the pier and saying to somebody, listen, there's enough fish there now to maintain the boat, pay the boat, have a good crew, modernize the boat, or even buy a new boat. How many of the lads do you think that are down the pier would, would say, oh, Jesus, I'm still going? Well, I haven't found one. So anything, anybody that says this is voluntary is only cutting themselves. There's nothing voluntary about this decommissioning. People are getting out because they fear the worst. They fear that if they stay fishing, if they catch too much of the wrong fish in their endeavours to make a living outside, they will be arrested, criminalised, fined, and they will lose everything one way or the other. And that's the reality of this. So there's nothing voluntary about this. This is this is crazy. There's a, there's a bigger question in, in this as well, is that I was speaking to a fishmonger on Wednesday and he's looking at his career, his business going out the window as well, because he's seeing at the moment with the tie-up scheme, the way it is, he's not able to get fish. And any fish that he's getting is getting more expensive. And like you are really looking at when you are taking away the fishing industry, you're taking away a lot more jobs. You're not just taking boats out of it. As I said before, it's not just boats that you're taking out of the, of the equation. Yeah, no, like there's 16,000 jobs. This is according to the state aid, CBIM. 16,000 jobs creating from fisheries. I, I, I think it's more. I genuinely would think it's more. I think people don't understand the additional jobs that, that would be coming from fishing, even if it's just uh, repairing gear or, or temporary work during the summer or a fellow painting a boat or, you know, uh, coming down that, that mightn't be inside the boat yard. But there are more people involved in it. And, and I think it is a way more, especially in rural communities. And you're not counting the amount of jobs that are given, like my, me, for instance. I have four kids. I, my lad is working in the muscles. It's his full-time occupation in part. And But my other three children earn their um, pocket money and their money from working in, in, in the business as well, too. And like that's three more jobs. So you're going from 16,000, then multiplying that by three. So maybe 40 or 50,000. So you're absolutely correct, you know? And these are the jobs that slip away without people noticing because they're not down as a, a professional in the industry. So all those jobs fall away. But like, I, I keep saying this, Oliver, I grew up in a small town in West Cork, right? I moved into the countryside and there is nothing happening where we were looking for things to happen when I was growing up. We were looking for factories, we were looking for jobs. It seems now that people are resigned that, you know, either you get a job online or you live at home, but there's no aspirations now. The kids are just growing up and they're, they're export. They're, they're the new export commodity of Ireland. And when it's happening, you know, it, it's, they're going to Australia for a year. They're going to America for a year. And people are, are so used to this happening now. It's not as big a shock as it was before, you know. Like I've seen in my hometown families and parents, you know, distraught that their kids were gone and they might never again see him. I suppose maybe with Skype and uh, and the new technology, they can talk to kids just like we are and maybe it lessens the blow uh, 
people are flying around the world more, you know, so there's a better chance of coming home. But still, that doesn't change the fact that they are leaving, you know. It still doesn't change the fact that people are moving from the rural areas into the towns and cities. So if you take one job out, I reckon that is a knock-on effect. It's like a, dom- a set of dominoes. And that's what's happening. And as I said, drive around the towns. Have a look at the shop windows. Are they being boarded up? They're being emptied. Is there curtains replacing goods? Of course they are. This is what's happening. And it'll come a stage. They're on about global warming. And once it goes past the critical point, we're all doomed. There's no different from that from, from rural Ireland. Like if if you keep taking the jobs and the enterprises and the indigenous enterprises, the ones that don't need investment from outside sources, all they need is the right to earn their living. Do you know what I mean? You can imagine a fella inside in a garage. Now, let, let, let's put this in context, right? There's a fella, he's out in, in, in Gary's, right? And he's got a garage. And uh, he's got 50 customers. Somebody knocks on the door and they say, Pierre's after joining, you know, he's after opening up the garage down the road. 85% of the cars that you're servicing now has to go to Pierre. How long would he survive? Pierre, he survived because he'll put the other fellow out of business and he'll take it over. That's what's happening with the fishing. We've lost 85% and we're left with 15%. And the only way we're going to balance the books, according to our government, is to get rid of one third of our demersal fleet. One third. You know, and like, they want to be creating divisions and stuff like that, but put it in context. We have through the task force where there are... Um, financial measures, right, Li- liquidity schemes and uh, tie-up schemes for another section of the fleet. And they are actually going to get as much in the three years as the same counterparts and numbers are looking to get to it, leave the industry forever. So if they get what has been submitted, it's 23 million, right? So that's, as we worked out, 60 boats on the other side, a million per boat, then they'll get as much money for three months tie up in three years, then the other side will get for their livelihoods and their businesses that may have been there for 30 or 40 years. Doesn't seem right. And we're talking about the the tie up scheme. There seems to be a question about a lot of quota being left in December and how it is distributed. Um, A recent article by the uh, Irish Fish and Seafood Alliance seem to misrepresent some of the facts, um, judging by your yeah, well, on the Facebook page. Yeah, well, you see, like to say that this is the department, you know, um, orchestrated this or did this, well, then they don't understand the, the, the way that it's um, organised during the year and organised is the way I describe it. So the minister has invited, right, um, experts within the industry to come in and give their opinion uh, and their advice month to month on how and what quotas allocations right across all the species should be allocated, right? So, as I said before, we're like accountants, right? Because the main objective isn't on the department side to give fish out to fishermen to make loads of money, right? It's an accounting exercise to make sure that we give out enough that boats will have a good chance of making a living but do so over the 12 calendar months. And we have members that are saying to us, look, Patrick, you can't give it all out at the start of the year. We'll have nothing at the end of the year. And coming into Christmas, if there's no money for our crews, then they're gone. And if they go in December and go to another job, then there's no guarantee they'll come back in January or February. And we already have crew shortages uh, there. The other complexities to this was, you know, after the TCA deal, even though they had agreed to giving away the amount of quota, there still hadn't been agreements in where the fish was to be caught, the technical measures that was going to be caught, and the actual TACs and each individual stocks, right? So that's normally agreed at the December Council of Ministers leading up to Christmas, and everybody's in agreement. And then come the first, before January, actually, after the December Council, everybody knows where they stand. But that didn't happen. So the European Union, without that agreement, had to wait, you see? before they could give out what they would have liked to give out, right? So let's put it this way. Again, the NGOs would complain about this. We look at the socioeconomic um, decisions, you know, the impacts of the decisions we'll make on the socioeconomic earnings of boats. 
and we look at the science. And if anybody looks at the science in the stat books, right, if they have done their research and do the digging, like I said, you will see in the stat books and all the species, they don't give a definitive amount of fish to catch. There's, there's a range and it's called the range. So you have the lower, the upper and the middle range, right? And that's the flexibility then for those in uh, Europe, I believe, to be able to give a little bit more with more information because in fairness to the scientists, they have to be precautionary. And that's what they do. So they, they, they act on the side of caution, which means they know they're giving a bit less and they know the formula. They're going to go a bit low, knowing that the, on the other side, they'll go a bit higher. So they go a bit lower to allow for the others going a bit higher. And that's in the advice. Do you know what I mean? So these are the unknown variables. So we didn't know what we could give out at the start of the year. So we too had to be cautious. We were instructed to be cautious. So as the year went on, then there was fluctuations. And again, when you dig a little deeper, you also see that boats changed their fishing patterns from previous years because of the uncertainty and whether we were going to get the fish or not, right? And fleets did so. And boats that hadn't been taking up opportunities suddenly started taking up. There was no swaps earlier on in the year because nobody knew what they'd need later on. Do you know what I mean? So all this was changing on a month-to-month -month basis. One month you'd give out a certain quota, and next you would fluctuate. And that's the reason. So at the end of the year, why did it end up high? Because we had a little bit of fish left over. Boats did go into the tie-up scheme. Weather conditions changed. So what we try and do is we try and give out the maximum. Not every boat is going to go out and catch 20 tonne of monk up in, in, in off the, the, the 6A, right? But the ones that are up there might. Do you know what I mean? So you give them every opportunity to have a good month. But if every boat went up there and caught the 20 tonne, should we be away behind in our quotas? So we have to work out with the knowledge that we have, the expert knowledge that we have, to give this advice. And both said are saying, well, you should have given it out earlier. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with that. We could have given out a bit more, but I'm only one voice inside in those um, discussions. And to be honest, I always have one of our uh, members of our organization here with us because they're the ones who it affects the most. Not me, I'm not out there fishing. It, 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 I don't gain or lose by the quotas that go out there, only up here, but not in the pocket. But these men depend on it. And I have to be conscious of weather conditions. We have to look at forecasts where boats can go if you're giving quotas in the wrong areas. Same with when we close down the park to try and look for temporary closures inside it to allow them to get more fish later on. Look at the market prices. December, as you said, is a good month for more prices. So when would you give out the fish? When prices are, are deflated during the summer, you double the quotas, destroy the price even further, or you try and balance it for the things. And, and look, I don't agree with the system. I would like to see it changed, genuinely. I have my own ideas on how you would change that. And that would be managing the fleet sector by sector, boat by boat, opportunity by opportunity. But no ITQs, right? But you'd actually operate that way. So if you know there was 50 boats going to the park, fine. They, they make X amount. Then you give the others in another sector that are concentrated and are not in prawns a little more. And you try and make sure everybody has an opportunity of making a living. And the, the best fishermen then would earn a little bit more than the others or the luckier fishermen, whichever the case may be. But to be told that we did it maliciously, to, to put up a smoke screen, knowing what the QMAC was, as if to pretend to say it was the department and there was nobody else involved. If you read those comments, you'd see the others knew it. So for, for the person to make that, a statement who was representing boats, representing fishermen, to make those allegations and scurrilous accusations, to be honest with you, and, and malign us for the job that we're trying to do, because he knows we were there by extension and that people would understand that, even though he didn't spell it out. And that's why I said I wasn't having it. It's it's hard enough in our job um, to represent fishermen. It's tougher still when there's people trying to divide us rather than unite us and cause trouble. And it was unfair commentary. And I explained why. And unfortunately, it wasn't taken in the manner that it was given. And it became personal. And for anybody to tell me to run along by or that I'm sticking my foot, my foot, my mouth, just shows them up for who they are, not me. But that's, that's, that's what they choose to do. It's not my way. The tire scheme, do you think it's come at the wrong time? You think 
the months of September, October, and November would have been better. Um, leave the boats to fish in December. You see, you've just highlighted now the frustrations that I and the others had in this. Like, we started this in April, like, and we were screaming for this from the get go. We were saying, tie up scheme should be started now. Then we were saying, oh no, we were told by the department, well, we've approached them with this and we've approached them with that. And you know why it didn't happen in September? Listen to this now, right? Because the Europeans and, and, and Brussels were going on holidays. Like, people's livelihoods, people's lives were being impacted here. And for Brussels to turn around and say, well, we took 20% of the fish off you, here's some money, but you know what? We'll give it out to you, or we'll talk about it when the timeline suits us. I'm off on holidays. Unbelievable. So it should have been done by September. Unbelievable. Because we are, like, corrected as a crisis. We're still in the middle of it, and for people in higher places just to decide that we're going on holidays because we need our holidays when there is there is existential crisis out there that needs to be addressed. You know, it's, it doesn't mean. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll put it to you this way now, Oliver, right? And, and you know the industry and I know the industry and it's a dangerous industry, right? And, and if you have people going out in bad weather and whatever else, like there's a risk involved in that, right? And for people to dismiss it then, because as I said, this is the reason we were given. No, Brussels was shutting down. They were all going on holidays. And, and that's why we didn't get it open. They came back in the decision in the, se in the first week of September. So we were short three or four days. So we couldn't even make the, the, the risk assessment to go for it in September and include September months and stretch it out. That, that, look, you can hear my voice and the shaking of my head and a frustration. But... Again, to put this in context of the ordinary person, can you imagine if you read in the papers tomorrow that the hospitals were shutting down because the staff were off on their holidays in the middle of a pandemic? Do you think it would be accepted? It wouldn't. There would be outrage. So why did these civil servants who knew there was a crisis, who knew what was at stake, decide, I'm off on holidays? It's just endemic of what we're facing as industry representatives. You know, it's it's just crazy. Like, just to explain this to you, you know, and, and everybody is watching. I used to take my holidays with my kids in June and July. And I was told by a department official that it was busy then, even though I continued to work while I was on holidays. There's no problem there, you know. I bring my laptop with me. I'm doing it from the office here. I do it from wherever I am and still joined the meetings. But they said, there was one or two meetings I didn't make, right? And they said, you should take your holidays in August like the rest of us. Do you know what I mean? So I did. That's what I do. I take my holidays in August with the others. But again, I bring my computer, my laptop with me. So um, I work from home and I'm always on the phone. And anybody that's watching this, you can always get me. The only time you won't get me when I'm talking to somebody else or doing something or asleep. But you can get me any other time and you can keep trying me. And that's the truth. That I, I know why... I have to do that because fishing is 24-7, uh, 12 months of the year, unless they're in a tie-up scheme. Um, you know, and 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 that's what we're that's the industry we're in. That's the industry, it's it doesn't stop. Um, like it was, we were talking before about um workers coming in, non-EU -E workers coming in and stuff like that. There, like the people who's making the rules doesn't seem to understand that you know there is no breaks in it. Once you're involved in this industry, it's there all the time. Yeah, you're after introducing another subject now again that'll get me all agitated and up and working. We've been saying this for four years that the, the, the atypical scheme, the legal instrument that you used, wasn't fit for purpose. <laughs> it, it, it was wrong, it was flawed from the outset. And and it's actually it's not it's not a catch-22 situation now anymore. To me, it's actually entrapment. You're forcing somebody to follow a legal instrument that they agree is flawed, right? And that they know they're going to fall foul of it, but they're going to do it anyway. So, like, you know, it's like taking somebody to the top of a, a cliff, right? And saying, well, you can pick up the gun and shoot yourself or jump off the other side. It's the same result. You're gone. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so these lads come into the country. They came in under their own system. People hired them because that's the way it was. It was no different for the nurses or anybody else. They all came in under these systems until the atypical schemes came in. Funny enough, the atypical scheme that came in for the fishermen 
wasn't the same as the atypical scheme introduced for, the, for any other sector, including the nurses. And, and at the end of four to five years now, when these lads are entitled, and they are entitled, they've worked and they've earned it, to leave the system that they're asked to participate in and go and, and, and have free choice, you know, a uh, freedom of choice. And they can either stay in an atypical scheme if they wish, or they can choose to become a share fisherman and understanding what that means, take the, the, the highs and the lows equally and probably join us on the ranks of looking for more fish that way they get more money. And, and that's it. And the reason why we know that this is logical is because a boat will not be able to sail without crew. So it's in the best interests of any boat operator, take these lads, take them to sea and pay them enough that they'll go out there again. That, that's it. And, and not abuse them. And that's it. But the way the system that is designed now is, is contrary to international maritime law. It doesn't meet the same legal requirements as the ILO Convention 118 or 188. Um, like that confuses me so, so many times. So in other words, just to explain it like this, if an atypical worker goes out on a boat and he works 80 hours in a week, right? They have massive fishing. They're doing well. They're flying. And he says to the skipper, well, I'm taking next week off, right? Then he can take it under the ILO regulation in lieu of hours worked, right? So the boat owner can pay him his bonuses and pay him for the two weeks, right? Okay? Not under the atypical scheme. You have to pay him for the 80 hours and you have to pay him for the 40 hours that he's out next week. Now, sometimes that'll work out in his favour, sometimes it won't. It's as simple as that. That's why these lads are looking for the stand for to have a choice, to be able to decide when they want to go home. And look, I spoke to some of these lads. You've seen me introducing, making sure that they spoke above in Dublin, you know, that we gave them the opportunity at, at the protests. They, they also were given the opportunity in Cork, right? And these lads were shy. They, as it keeps pointing out, their English isn't the best. But you've seen the passion that, that is captured on video about these lads. And all they want to be done is treated fairly, you know? And they're staying on board the boats. They're working on board the boats. They become part of the family on board those boats. And are some mistreated? I can't speak for that. Do I condone it? Absolutely not. I condemn it. Any man that's going out to sea to risk his life, to earn his living, should be paid fairly and properly by the people that are taking him out there. They've earned it. Right? No man should be treated different from the lead alongside him. Unfortunately, a typical scheme of fishing is slack, then the atypical worker will score in that scenario um, over the other lead. That, that's rare enough. They have to make that minimum money or you're not going to keep your crews, you know, unfortunately. Well, with the last 20% of, of, of our fish now, that might change as well too. But yeah, so the, so do they listen? Do Are they aware of it? If they're not aware of it, then they choose so, because I can assure you, uh, Oliver, we have pointed out the flaws in the system and we've been at it for years. And it is really frustrating because anybody can come in and sit down alongside me for a day and see the amount of information and the legislative changes that are coming right across the spectrum. And we can't ignore that. We have to go through it. We have the wind farms. We have our quotas. The list that we do, people think that the POs are what are they doing? Come with us for a day and, and I'll show you. And, it, and it's endless. And it is just unbelievable what, what, what amount of work you have to get through. It's not sitting down in front of a keyboard to type out uh, a, a nasty letter or a response. We, we roll our sleeves up, we get involved, and we try and change things for the better. Do we achieve it? Uh, not as often as I'd like. Do we do things behind the scenes that, that nobody will ever hear about? You can be assured of that. That is 100%. Do we vilify the people that we're trying to work with when they deserve it? But when they're being accused in the wrong, we certainly do not. With, with the atypical scheme, yes, we're trying to change it. We have two ministers, in fairness to them, and I'll mention them, Damien English and Minister Brown, who have now taken on board that this and acknowledged this scheme is not fit for purpose and they're working on it. Are they frustrated the way the system operates as well too? The same as us working with the same civil servants and civil servants like them? Of course they are. Can they do anything about it? Hopefully. And that's what I'd say, hopefully. But like this, this is what we're up against. And, and the, you know, pass the book, kick the can? Absolutely. And this all means time passes 
people get frustrated and they say, well, why isn't that happening? Like, if you think you're frustrated out there thinking nothing's happening, can you imagine the person that's banging their head up against the wall to try and make it happen every day of the week, seven days a week, how frustrated we are? It is not easy. I'll tell you that. It, not a whole. And look, you see people coming and going in this job. Few of them have stayed on for long term and not because of the terms and conditions. It's the stress of the job. Like if, if you take this home with you, you carry a lot of baggage. I can I can assure you that or any other person that's watching this. What do you think is achievable um, before the end of the year? Is there anything that the department can do? Is there anything that the minister can do? Is there anything, you know, we've got basically, well, suppose they're going on holidays in two weeks' time or whatever it is. So we might not we might not get very much done, but is there anything we could look at? I always believe this. there's a will, there's a way. And, and this is the truth for, for the organisation I work with. No matter what problem we come up against, we'll always try and put a solution on the table to deal with that problem. The problem is with that is that if it's not adopted or it's not used, then the frustration kicks in. So any anything that you say to me, where's the solution? I'll give it to you. And I mean that. So as I said to you, our problem that we don't have enough fish is very simple. We look at the catch records of all the other countries, like we did at the very start. And you see, well, you caught all this fish between the reference years. Are you still catching it? No? Right. Give it back. We need it. We have a fleet now that'll catch it. We have a country that depends on it. <laughs> we can't see that information, but I know it's out there. I can assure you it's out there because there's plenty of information that collaborates what I'm saying. So there you go. What can they do? Go and talk to their colleagues in Europe and say, listen, we want this fish. If you won't give it to us, we'll take it into the European Parliament. We'll get our MEPs to go looking to the other countries that don't have any fishing interests. And we'll try and see what they do have. And we'll negotiate with them what we could give them in return for their support in the European Parliament for getting more fish for our country. That's how you do it. Have you ever heard of an MEP or a politician saying that ever, anywhere? Of course not, because it will require rolling up the sleeves and doing some work. And that's what it means. And I don't care if they lend base me for this. Where is it? I'll sit down with any politician. And I've sat down with a few. And there are a few that are willing after our conversations to do this. And as I said, the, the diary is so full. I had different things in my own life to put on, on, on hold. And and you just takes time to get around to this stuff. But yeah, there are the positives? Absolutely. Do you know why? I'll tell you the main positive. We have a fantastic fishing ground all around our coastline. We have the most skilled people in the world to catch and utilize that product if we can bring it in. We have the brains and the intelligence in our workforce to turn that into something great. And we have markets of millions and millions of people that want it. So that's the positives. What we need to do to make that a realization that we can use to our benefit is go to Europe and look for an equal share and equal opportunities to our own resource as they do in their countries. So let me say that again. Yeah, so I want the same equal rights and equal opportunities as any other fisherman in Europe. I want the same rights as the Belgian fishermen or the French or the Spanish or anybody else to catch the same quantities of fish in their waters and our waters. We have 15%. I don't believe for a second that the Belgians only catch 15% or the Spanish or anybody else, you know, of the fish in their waters. If, however, there are figures coming out that we're catching 41% of the fish in our own waters, then I want that proven. And the way I want it proven is this. I want those who are making those claims, show me where the fish is being caught and who's catching it. That's what I keep asking for. And I can assure you, they don't add up. The figures are incorrect. And that's the truth, because if it was correct, we're catching, we have 190,000 tonnes of fish, we have 170,000 according to the stock book this year. If we're catching 41% of that inside in our waters, we're catching around 60,000. But if, if 60,000 are set, sorry, no, maybe a bit more, oh, a second now. Yeah, around 70,000, right? Okay. Well, if 70,000 and we're catching 41%, then that means the entire amount of fish being caught in Irish waters is around 100,000 
to 100 to 120,000 tons of fish. Now, is there anybody on the planet who believes that? Not a whole. Absolute. The blue whiting, mackerel, scad, you know, even the pelagic species, that's rubbish. So, like, we have some solutions. We have ministers that need to listen to what we're saying to them. Us, <laughs> and I mean the Southwest, and I make no apologies for that. And we can show them the evidence that we've gathered and, and, the, and the calculations that we've done and ask him to take those to Europe to his colleagues over there and just ask for equal rights and equal opportunities for the Irish people in their own waters as the, they in turn demand for their people in their waters. So that's, that's it. That, that's the solution. As usual, it's always been a pleasure speaking to you and it's always interesting. You learn something more and something new every time. And maybe we might be able to get you on after the December Council and we'll get your opinion on what the results from that was. Okay, no problem. And give me a bit more time to go through the figures and analyse them. But like, just, just to finish on that before we go, like the scientists have me confused. We look at the Hague fishery. Right, and we see the recruitment is good. We're fishing below MSY. The biomass of the stock is going up. The catch rates are down. Yet they're looking to cut it another twenty-four to twenty-seven percent, and the European Union will allow it to be cut twenty percent. Now we go in from uh, a very small amount of fish um, down again twenty percent. Do, do you know what I mean? To the white fish sector, that's devastation to our boats. Like this makes no sense especially when we're only allowed to catch 3,000 tonnes, less than 3,000 tonnes, out of a pot of, 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 of well over 50. Like, this is where our minister should be standing up. So we always hear about the Hague preferences and all the rest. They were, they, they were done back in 1973 or 83. What way were the stocks then? What way was the science? So the trigger mechanism back then do not marry the trigger ne mechanisms that need to be applied now and under unit class law. Now we have countries saying, oh, we want to get rid of the Hague preferences altogether. And then we have to look at another way to protecting the sustainability of the stocks in our waters. And after December Council, I will give you my view on that. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, Patrick. Um, we'll chat to you again. No problem. Anytime, Oliver. Mm -hmm.